Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this one more Cloud Lunch and Learn session. I'm Jackson Felden and will be your moderator for today. And today I have here standby with me, Laszlo Fogas. He is going to tell us all about the click ops and over GitOps. That's the presentation now in the standby. And if you guys have any questions from home, just you know, please make sure you add on the chat box and then I will ask those questions to Laszlo and he can tackle those for us. Uh, okay, Laszlo, if you want to give a quick intro about yourself and then I will share your screen and you can take over. Of course. Uh, thank you, Jackson, for having me. And uh, hello, everyone. I hope you enjoy your lunch and I hope you're going to be enjoying this session as well. I am Laszlo uh, Fogas. Uh, I'm based in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, I'm leading a small company called Gimlatayo. We are a three person team. Our roots in the uh, cloud engineering and cloud consulting business, but in the past years, we've been bootstrapping a product called Gimlet, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, most characteristic characteristically, it's it's about this idea, click ops over GitOps. And I, I'm going, going to tell you about this a little bit more uh, in this uh, coming one hour or, or perhaps less. Or so, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, let me share your screen and then you can kind of, you know, take over. Yeah, your screen is there. And yeah, anyway, I will be here on the background. If you need anything, let me know. Otherwise, yeah, the floor is yours. Of All course. Right. Uh, th thank you very much. Yeah, so our website is Gimlet.io. It's Kubernetes tooling packaged for small companies and, and, and growing uh, startups as well. It's basically trying to tackle the idea that uh, the cloud native uh, space is quite big there are many tools around and i think pretty much every company these days try to solve this problem uh by you know picking and choosing components from the landscape and building their internal platform and pretty much if if you are too small to have an in-house platform team or or you are stressed with time and you want good baselines uh for gitops i think Gimlet is is uh, is is one way to do it and we definitely think that uh uh we, we can offer some value here and my presentation today is about clickops over gitops now this sounds a little bit catchy perhaps and uh but let me clarify what i mean by clickops and gitops so uh the agenda for today is uh clearing out clickops that's that's the first thing that we want to do and uh i usually talk about platform engineering a little bit uh however i decided that i might skip it uh, because it's it's pretty well known topic uh, by now, maybe not. So so Jackson, if you think that uh, we could uh, touch or 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 talk about platform engineering, let me know. Otherwise, I will just uh, uh, jump into the demos and and the hardcore things. So I already introduced myself. Uh, basically. Uh, the only thing that I haven't said is that you can find me uh, on meetups in the Nordics region uh, and also in Hungary in, in the cloud native space. And I think uh, I'm, I'm on more and more meetups as well in Austria. So if you're there, uh, there on a cloud native meetup, there is a chance that we could uh, uh, come together and just uh, chat, you know, about uh, these topics. All right, but ClickOps. So what it is, it's definitely not about clicking on the AWS console. So uh, I know that uh, many people associate this term with uh, actually, you know, clicking on the dashboard and also associate this term with the bad, uh, bad practices. You know, when you set up your cloud infrastructure on the console, you might be quick on the setup part, but you're gonna have inconsistencies and, and you know, just uh, the, the management hassle is going to be a pain over time and cleaning that up getting it onto the right uh, infrastructure as code practices is just a very time consuming thing. I should know that I used to be a consultant. I did that many, many times. People just start using the cloud and then at some point they want to do compliance and so on and they have to, you know, use Terraform and, you know, have to have processes and stuff and, and uh, finding and solving those little inconsistencies is really, 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 really time consuming. But what is ClickOps? Uh, in, in my understanding, it's basically doing cloud operations by clicking on the dashboard. So far, it's the thing that you've been thinking about, but uh, there's a twist here. The twist is that, uh, that every click you make should be backed by a little code change in your infrastructure as code repository. So imagine this, if you are uh, 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 into Terraform, uh, you click something on the dashboard and automatically the, the, the the cloud provider would generate you Terraform code. How cool would be that? Uh, 
this is not my idea. I, I read it in a blog post uh, like a year and a half ago. I think I will uh, I will have a slide about uh, the the blog post which uh, originated this this interpretation of ClickOps. But I very much like the idea because uh, you know we are very much into CLIs and command line interfaces and you know um, doing everything from the terminal. But it's just dashboards have a certain uh, productivity gains. Uh, there's a reason that we are using browsers like graphical interfaces and not uh, uh, using terminal-based uh, uh, browser and email clients and so on, because it makes common tasks uh, fast to do. Um, and it also makes very accessible for people. So maybe it's it's not you who want to do everything, everything on a dashboard, but maybe your teammate. And when it comes to cloud infrastructure and uh, DevOps trends that we try to involve and you know, shifting uh, the, the cloud provisioning and operations work more and more to, to the developer's side, giving them tools uh, is actually uh, probably the only way uh, that, that this makes sense. And dashboards could be a, a great way to, to involve uh, not just hardcore, cloud and Kubernetes experts in, in, in operations, uh, cloud operations. And of course, it's, it's not about all the things, but you know the things that uh, commonly you want to do on, on a regular week, deploy rollback, hey, give me an RDS, RDS database, and so on. And again, the twist, it's very important that uh, the ClickOps approach in this interpretation does not stand in the way of, of uh, more advanced users or knowledgeable people who just want you to, you know, to touch the underlying uh, layers of the infrastructure, the Terraform code base, uh, the network configuration, and all those things that uh, they are able to do today. It's more about uh, making it more accessible for people, uh, not just the experts. So why ClickOps? Why is the, uh, this idea? And I think uh, I sort of already answered this uh, to some uh, extent, it's basically uh, it's basically a simply a productivity thing. It's like I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure that you are doing all these uh, nice CDK, Pulumi, Terraform approaches, but you can also see that sometimes it's just very time consuming, like like setting something up that is not non-trivial or there is a new uh, setting. It's often not. Uh, reaching uh, the latest version of these providers, and it's sometimes it's very annoying to you know setting up these infrastructure as code setups. So this was a, a, a very funny tweet that uh, why press a button in the console when you can spend three weeks writing the same thing in infrastructure as code? I, I definitely uh, um, this this resonated with me uh, this approach but of course there is the other side of the table which is i already uh, told you like why spend three weeks on writing code because uh, or, or if, if you could spend three months cleaning the mess up that you've been doing on the on the, on the dashboard so it's sort of uh, we are not using infrastructure as code tools because they are so great. Uh, they get the job done, but there is, I think, uh, some way to go until it's becoming uh, uh, comfortable for everyone. Um, and is it a new thing? As I told you, uh, in this interpretation, it's it's a relatively new thing. It's like a year and a half old. Uh, there is this guy, Corey Quinn. He is uh, is very active on Twitter, and he he posts uh, funny things and memes and everything. But most most importantly, he calls out uh, the cloud providers when they do something. Uh, uh, um, not very clever pricing approaches and stuff. So he's very keen on, uh, you know, optimizing your cloud costs. And and he had a blog post, and you can find it on Google and everything. And and he proposed this idea that what if I could use the console and it wouldn't be a shameful thing, and I could, you know, click but still get stuff in my infrastructure as code repositories. Um, and. It, is there any tools that do this? I think there are a few tools that I think you, you, you have seen similar already that you click the button and it opened the pull request in your code base with some changes and tools that have some level of this in, 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 uh, in, in, in them. I, I definitely call them ClickOps tools. Uh, I think CodeFresh has something like that. Uh, Gimlet definitely has uh, this approach and you will see it in the demo later on. And um, yeah, uh, also in like a Getport IO, which is like a, an internal developer portal solution. It has a, a way to run uh, pre-configured Terraform snippets. So if you need an RDS database or you need a Redis queue, uh, you don't have to, you know, knock on the uh, 
platform team or sysadmin or, or ops teams door uh, and you don't even have to you know like do your terraforms but you can run these one-off terraform snippets of the portal and i i'm pretty sure that uh, all those platform engineering efforts that are ongoing in companies of course they start with the baselines and everything but they they want to shift left some of the provisioning things to to uh, developers the, the common things all right, I touched platform engineering, uh, but I don't want to get into it uh, in depth. However, maybe when I finish my presentation, I'm happy to, to dig deeper as well. So it's, uh, I could talk about it uh, endlessly. So uh, it's more like I want to show you use cases and, and, uh, and, and ways we, we uh, sort of uh, use this ClickUp click approach. And yeah, the first use case is uh, like uh, Kubernetes. So, so we are about GitOps and, and Kubernetes, uh, where you know things are represented with YAML files, and <clears throat> when you apply a YAML file on your cluster, that resource is going to be eventually created and then uh, capitalized by, by Kubernetes. And uh, one of the very first things that uh, people want to do uh, when they uh, uh, started Kubernetes is that they need some manifests. And how do they get those deployment descriptor manifests and config maps and services and ingresses and and the long and then the list goes on? Is that uh, they read blog posts and they copy paste things together. If they are lucky, they have a, a platform team in their organization and they pr provide uh, them blueprints. Uh, like, hey, this is how we deploy a service. This is the YAML file that we do, and. Uh, the very first thing that we did with Gimlet is that uh, we tried to uh, help the, this manifest uh, creation process uh, in a visual way. And uh, it's actually available on the internet, uh, on our website. If you click uh, YAML generator, you see the same uh, React component, which is open source, by the way, uh, that you can use to generate Kubernetes YAML. So, if you, let's say, change the replica, that's uh, the very first thing that uh, uh, people show you, the replica count. On the right side, you see how uh, in your deployment resource, the replicas uh, uh, equals four. And if I change it back to two, it is two. So it's basically uh, a YAML generator, like what you would expect. There are common things that you can do. You can add environment variables like, uh, one of the infamous environment variables is node env. Um, and if you set, set it to production, suddenly you see that a new config map resource was, was put in uh, into the manifest and the value production and so on. And uh, as I said, uh, this was the very first thing that we did in Gimlet. And uh, this is actually a very general uh, generic approach uh, because what we do here is that we render a UI for Helm charts, uh, for Helm charts, which have a, a JSON schema specified. So uh, we have our own Helm chart. Uh, it's called one chart. It's a, it's a generic Helm chart for uh, typical web application deployment. Uh, the defaults are sensible. So in, in this Helm chart, uh, which is one chart slash one chart, um, if you don't add any values, you get deployed a container and that's an nginx container and that's actually the the default up here but if you uh, change it to i don't know acr is that iui i'm not sure and then my company slash my app and then the tag latest which you should never use but uh, just for now yeah, not even for the example uh, yep then uh, you can see that this is basically the Helm values file that's get, that gets generated uh, by your actions on, on the UI uh, that you, yeah. And uh, as I said, this, is, this uh, component is open source and uh, it works with any Helm charts that have a schema defined. And basically this is what Gimlet uses as well uh, to generate uh, the many, I think this is like a hundred lines of YAML code. Um, resources and limits and whatnot and things that regular developers should not even care about. Much of this is boilerplate. But back to here, so the use first use case is manifest ordering. And I believe uh, since Kubernetes is uh, a manifest based and if you apply a manifest, Kubernetes tries to deploy it. If you write a UI that creates a manifest, you pretty much 
uh, automated or like like offer this to a lot more people uh, who doesn't necessarily know everything Kubernetes. So this was the first use case, and this is this was a very simple use case. I'm pretty sure you have solutions that uh, handles this uh, situation. Um, uh, the second use case is. Uh, is still related to Kubernetes' uh, manifest uh, creation process and the built-in resources you have, but it's just just to 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 iterate on like how the world used to be before Kubernetes. It was very you know slow and fragmented, and you know you have to you had like having a, a DNS changed uh, in your organization could could mean like a week's uh, waiting time. But with Kubernetes and the controllers that. Uh, that performed the work for Kubernetes uh, solved this. So basically, uh, updating a DNS record today with the Kubernetes ingress resource and the matching controller, it's nothing more than, uh, again, a YAML entry. Uh, and it actually has two parts, back to the, uh, to the YAML generator. If you do the ingress and you set uh, mycompany.com, uh, you see that an ingress resource is generated down here and it's mapped onto mycompany.com. So this is the creation part, the, the authoring part. And of course, there has to be some machinery in place, uh, like the external DNS controller for Kubernetes, which means uh, whenever you add a new ingress to Kubernetes, it creates uh, the DNS entry automatically at, uh, in the DNS provider so database. Uh, many providers have APIs for that, Cloudflare, uh, Route 53, and all that. So, so it's pretty uh, pretty accessible. So this use case is not much different than the previous one. I just want to highlight that uh, uh, largely these problems are reduced to just creating a little text uh, snippet, YAML snippet, and putting it to a Git repository. Same goes with secret handling. Um, now, secret handling is, is a special workflow uh, because it's usually uh, decoupled from application deployment because there is usually a secret system where you have to punch in those secrets and then you, you have to reference those secrets. Uh, with GitOps and Kubernetes, you actually have uh, a possibility to use both approaches. Uh, one is using uh, another controller called external secrets operator, which can work with Azure's uh, key store and uh, Amazon's and uh, 20 other key stores. And you can basically uh, reference any secret from those uh, secret stores. And uh, again, comes down to just generating a little uh, YAML snippet into your infrastructure as code uh, repository. And again, you can generate that uh, with the UI. So you are clicking and you are getting your YAML into a GitOps uh, repository. Yes, so this is basically if you use uh, the other approach, which is like an encrypted version of your secret inside the Git repository, then this is the YAML snippet that you have to create in order to, you know, have secrets in your uh, application. All right. And here it becomes a bit more uh, interesting. Uh, so far, we've been relying on uh, Kubernetes uh, built in resources. But turns out uh, that the Kubernetes resource model, like uh, Kubernetes have custom resource definitions. It's, it's uh, the Kubernetes resource model is very extensible and people have uh, created many custom resources that are readily available. Crossplane, for example, mapped all the cloud providers, all the all resources. I think it's generated by uh, Terraform uh, modules uh, automatically. So I think that this is how they sort of uh, uh, reached uh, this good state. But basically, if you, um, maybe in the next slide, I have an example for that. Uh, no, not here. But if you um, go to Crossplane and you try to uh, look at the documentation and you want to get started uh, with uh, by creating, let's say, um, a database. If you install Crossplane, basically, uh, let me just find this YAML bit. If you want to create an S3 bucket, this again, uh, just 10 lines of YAML. Kind is a bucket, API version is, you know, something, something uh, Crossplane. Uh, and you, you provide the name and just a few uh, values. And if you apply this to Kubernetes, 
uh, cross-plane the controller were created in, uh, at the cloud provider's end. So this is quite powerful actually, uh, because um, again, you just have to uh, put a few bits of YAML into a repository and you can manage the whole world basically around you. And uh, the ClickOps idea is, uh, is basically this, uh, is that uh, you click on the, uh, on, on, on the dashboard, something like this is generated, it's, it is written into a Git repository. So that's sort of the tools responsibility. And then on Kubernetes is, uh, and, and the controllers inside Kubernetes uh, do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, okay, uh, and actually there is something in Gimlet uh, that uh, is, uh, is doing something uh, like this. Um, if you want to create like a database, uh, like this is, uh, this is the Gimlet manifest file. Uh, you haven't seen this before, but you definitely have seen the values. It's uh, referring to a Helm chart on a certain version with the values. So basically this is, this is the output of the YAML generator. Uh, and if you want to uh, refer to some other resources, like uh, you want to create a database, uh, then you can refer to either a uh, cross-plane composition uh, with some configuration parameters, or uh, actually uh, Terraform has been uh, also um, ported to this Kubernetes resource model, and you can refer to a, a Terraform's uh, module, uh, and Terraform modules are basically just uh, uh, little pieces of Terraform code with some input uh, var uh, variables. So again, uh, this is reused to just creating a manifest with a few parameters, putting it into a Git repository. And you can do that by hand, of course, but you can click it together on a dashboard. All right, um, I'm just repeating uh, myself here. Uh, Kubernetes uh, custom resources are very powerful, uh, like if you if you know if you know Helm, you probably know Helm. You want to install an nginx uh, component, uh, a Grafana or a Prometheus. You reach out to a Helm chart, and you typically write Helm install or Helm update uh, to your cluster. And with a few um, parameters set, you have these components running in your cluster. And the good part of uh, of this is that it's a very imperative, you know, like you type something and it goes into cluster, uh, or you put it into a bash script or a shell script, and it you run it and then it goes to the cluster. So that's a very uh, imperative way. And but if you go, want to go declarative and you want to put uh, just you know, hey, I want a Helm uh, chart installed on my cluster, then you can put it uh, this into a YAML file into this custom resource called Helm release. Uh, the spec part shows uh, the chart. You re refer to, or you point to a chart and the version, and you set the values. And basically, Kubernetes is going to install these charts. So again, uh, complicated things like uh, get me Grafana, Prometheus, Loki, uh, Cert Manager, OAuth proxy, and many other things. Again, this is just reduced to a very simple thing, which is this YAML piece. And of course, you have to know like uh, what to write into this YAML. But if you know how to alter it, either by hand or, or through a dashboard, then you are you are very uh, you know you, you you streamlined your operations into just uh, just one uh, mode of representation. And basically, this is what Gimlet does. For example, with Helm charts, uh, we maintain a curated set of components. You can think of this as a marketplace that refers to uh, community Helm charts. So this is the first time I'm, I'm jumping into the Gimlet interface just to show you this marketplace. Um, uh, and basically in Gimlet, there are uh, Git repositories and there are environments and I have a demo environment right now. And the components here I could install is just a handful of components. Uh, this is extendable and it's uh, based on an open source uh, Git repository, there is like a JSON structure that defines the marketplace items. And right now there is only the Gimlet agent is installed, but if I want to install, let's say uh, Grafana, uh, let's say, let's see where is Grafana. Or oh, yeah, I want to install Prometheus. I come here, I enable it. I set a few typical parameters. You know, Helm charts have 
pages and pages and pages long of configuration. But if you just want to get started or you want something that uh, works uh, for sure, you can come here and you can set uh, persistent uh, persistence enabled for 14 days. Uh, you save it. And here comes the, uh, the good part. Uh, this is, you know, like the ClickOps uh, approach is that it, it doesn't just, you know, calls the uh, uh, the Kubernetes API and then it does like a one-off change like you would typically do. Instead, it opens a pull request. So this is the first time we witness uh, the ClickUp's approach. And here in the uh, uh, the change, you can definitely observe what has happened. And I was talking about the Helm release custom resource so far. And you can definitely see that uh, all Gimlet did was creating this uh, Helm release resource uh, referring to the Grafana uh, Helm chart and set a few uh, values. And also Prometheus uh, with um, whatnot um, settings about pod labels and stuff. This is, this is sort of the knowledge that you only gain by doing stuff and maintaining things long-term that you can go with the, with the Helm chart and use the default stuff, default settings, but uh, for example, it, that will generate just too many labels. And if you use Grafana Cloud, for example, your billing by default is just going to be off the chart. So it's, you've, you will not fit into the free plan, for example. And this is what we uh, optimize a bunch of things uh, in this marketplace. All right, but back, back to the original idea. If I uh, uh, merge this pull request, um, or my, my teammates reviewed it and I merged it, uh, it will be deployed on the cluster and I will be able to access uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, now, um, I could probably show you this in, uh, in Kubernetes as well, uh, but maybe I first, I just go through uh, the, uh, the presentation. All right, so use case five was about the same thing. And basically the summary is that Kubernetes resources and their co controllers reduced infrastructure, work, provisioning, management, and everything to putting YAML files into Git repositories. And if you just put YAML files into the Git repositories, uh, we can definitely uh, automate uh, this part. For example, our a component can uh, manage any hand chart and, and you can write the values into this Git repository. You can also discover what possibilities there are. And the same is true, uh, becoming true very soon uh, with Terraform and cross-plane modules in Gimlet. So if you need uh, an RDS database, uh, Gimlet will be able to understand the Terraform module, uh, figure out what input variables it has, and it generates uh, a UI for, for your uh, team, your uh, developers on your team. So if they want to have an RDS DB, they're just gonna come here, to the repositories view, uh, they deploy the test application and they're gonna uh, click edit and they're gonna pick a dependency like, hey, I need an RDS or Redis and so on. And of course, it's it's uh, all these things are, are specific to your to your company and environment. Of course, I understand that. Uh, there are VPC setups and subnets and all that. Uh, that's why uh, there will be no uh, like, a generic list of all the components that people can uh, sorry people can provision instead uh, the, uh, the the platform engineer or the cloud administrator has to allow, put a few components onto onto an allow list like uh, yes we typically use redis elasticsearch rabbitmq and these are the things developers can create uh, themselves so uh, instead of uh, adding an environment variable uh, they will uh, set the database size and the queue name and so on, or or the bucket name, and uh, everything gets provisioned. And uh, yeah, all right. I actually want to show you like uh, uh, now. You this screen can look familiar to you because this is basically the same React component that we are running on uh, on the website as a standalone uh, little tool. Uh, basically. I just want to show you like uh, uh, how to reconfigure an application's manifest in Gimlet. Uh, first of all, if I go to the test app uh, source code, there is a .gimlet folder. And if I want to uh, look at the demo uh, environments uh, file uh, or Gimlet manifest, you can definitely see this in, in, in Git and you can 
click edit and you can uh, change the values and so on. Uh, however, you can do the same approach or the same thing in, uh, uh, in, in, on the dashboard. So you see the diff, what has changed, you save it, what you expect, a pull request is open to this, to this file, uh, the change set is what you see, and if you merge it uh, soon, you will be able to deploy this uh, new uh, revision. So up here, you can see uh, the test apps uh, commits. Uh, we just made a commit to the repository, so the build is running. There are, there are references to the GitHub Actions that is running here. It does uh, Docker building and so on. And then it, it's going to push an image. That's the last step. And then it's going to notify Gimlet that, hey, there's something that you can deploy soon. So uh, soon it's just going to become green. All right, there is a little uh, check mark. And I actually wanted to see here something uh, like a deploy button, which is for some reason it's not there. Uh, maybe I uh, misconfigured uh, this test application uh, in the settings, you know, how GitHub Actions, uh, how does it communicate uh, with uh, Gimlet, uh, not deploy keys, but secrets and variables. And there's a Gimlet server and token, which I probably set it to some other uh, instance of Gimlet. So that's my uh, <laughs> mess up of this demo. Uh, but uh, two days ago, I was testing this environment. And uh, in this uh, commit, I, th I think I uh, made a similar change, maybe not. Yeah, never mind. What what did I do here? Yeah, so here replicas uh, was set to two, and what has happened here? Hmm. Anyways, I think I can uh, I can fix the CI if you if you have time uh, for me. Uh, I can generate an API key uh, and set the the CI. So parameters, or you can just believe me that that I can uh, can fix it. And basically, this is how you deploy different commits, uh, different application commits onto uh, a cluster. As you can see, uh, there was some flashing here. This is the different pods we have, and uh, there is also like a little panel here that uh, which version I'm releasing, where I am releasing, which manifests are written. And if I actually click this again. You can see that uh, in the background, uh, actual things are put into Git. So if you are into GitOps, like the Argo CD way or Flux, uh, you have been uh, changing perhaps these repositories by hand or with a CI script. Uh, and it's the same with Gimlet. If you make a click, it changes the GitOps repository. It uh, rewrote some uh, uh, application manifests and it tracks the applied state uh, pretty much as they, as it is done in Argo CD. Uh, what is not there in Argo CD and Flux is uh, Flux, uh, Gimlet tries to go uh, a little further than these tools and it tries to associate uh, technical release commits with actual code versions. So I just want to highlight a couple of things that uh, people uh, are usually frustrated with if they are doing GitOps is that it's very difficult to tell like uh, which Git commit deployed, which application uh, release. And if you use Gimlet, you can definitely see uh, there is this little uh, deployment indicator, uh, like which commit is deployed. And also up top, you see uh, the deployment and there, there's an ingress, you see that and config, config maps and so on. But you also see uh, which application revision was deployed. And you have like a, a little, uh, trail of deployment history. Uh, somebody deployed something six hours ago and two minutes ago and two days ago. And two minutes ago, it was me and I deployed this commit. Uh, and it's definitely useful uh, when it comes to GitOps because GitOps has this information in the Git repository. However, getting uh, this trail of changes is often not trivial. I think uh, 
I know this because I've implemented it, but I also hear this from different people that uh, GitOps is great on paper, but to actually get all those benefits, you have to have the right tooling and so on. And you can also roll back to the previous version and so on. All right. Um, there is one thing with ClickOps though, and uh, this is probably your pushback as well, is that, yeah, you cannot do everything on, on dashboards. And, you know, dashboards are usually just blocking me to do the right stuff. And that's correct. Uh, I think all these tools have to know their places. Uh, they are making things more accessible, but it shouldn't be on the expense of, you know, uh, uh, pro users or, or uh, knowledgeable people's uh, way and workflows. So. If you have a tool that writes your infrastructure as code files, you must not break anything inside those repositories. So if somebody edits or extends or changes something outside of the tool, so directly in the source code, you should not break. And definitely do not lose any edits uh, other people is making. And uh, in Gimlet, we have a three-way merge uh, algorithm uh, that is able to in most cases decide like 95% of cases decide like what is the right version it's you know and sometimes you have uh, um, merge conflicts but that's only if you do uh, uh, funky things so that's one thing uh, if you use uh, dashboards and you want to cooperate or coexist with uh, with the world outside of you you have to be robust and the other thing is avoid the scope creep I mentioned a few times that yes, you can use cross-plane uh, resources, Terraform scripts, or or you can call Pulumi uh, applications and so on, but it it just it just cannot be for everything. And I think the right scope uh, for uh, the visual tools is that uh, is again circling back to the original point is that for the everyday things, uh, the supported things, it's not for. Uh, spinning up the latest open AI component in Asia and uh, creating three VPCs and connecting it with whatever uh, service. It's about the supported platform uh, elements like, uh, yes, our company typically uses uh, Azure storage accounts for storing things. Then if you want a new storage account, uh, yes, then you can have a Terraform snippet or Terraform module that is uh, encapsulating the typical uh, usage of those uh, storage accounts and exposing just a, a, a fair, just just uh, just just a tiny bit of uh, of uh, configurability, uh, like uh, region or maybe if you are only in one region, no region. Name is definitely one of those things that you want to uh, customize. Again, so scope creep, uh, we are not building here a general purpose Terraform editor or a, a big UI that can map everything in your cloud account. It's more like uh, we like GitOps, we like infrastructure as code, but we also know that this will only satisfy uh, so many people. There is another bunch of people who need help and need guard rails. And I think UIs in this sense uh, can be very helpful. So this is us, uh, Gimlet.io. Uh, we are open source and uh, we are on uh, GitHub. If you liked what you heard and if you, if you like this idea or find it interesting, uh, we definitely uh, appreciate a star here. Uh, it's, we've been ne neglecting this metric and uh, we are pretty much behind of competitors. So I, if, you, if you are uh, able to give us a star, super kudos and thank you very much. And in the documentation, you can read more about uh, the Gimlet things, and we also have a SaaS version. So if you just want to uh, quickly jump to the to this part, then you should sign up, and uh, and you you will see your Git repositories in here. You click one of the repositories. There is a little bit of a setup step, which there is like a few tutorials that you can uh, that you can follow, um, and then you will be able to deploy rollback uh, and have this marketplace uh, with you with the usual components. And uh, that's that. That was it. And I'm I'm hope uh, hoping you liked what you you heard. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them.
Okay, th th thanks very much for for all the the information. I would advise the the recording should be available now at any minute in YouTube. If you want to add your GitHub repository as a link, and then just to make you know easier for everybody. Uh, Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, just checking here. Yeah, we haven't got any any questions on the chat box. Maybe you explained too well, and then everybody understood everything. Uh, but yeah, th th that's great. Yeah, thanks very much for for your time with us, and I hope to to see you again at some stage in the future. All right. Uh, thank you for having me, Jackson. And uh, I'm also happy to answer questions in the, uh, under the YouTube video. So if anything pops up, I'm gonna be there. So thank you, Jackson, and everyone. Yes. Okay. Okay, everybody watching us from home. Thanks very much for joining us today, and make sure you keep updated and follow us on on LinkedIn and all the social media. And we should be back on next Wednesday again. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. See you, everyone.